Hello everyone, welcome back to part 2 of our home networking series. We were really surprised by the overwhelming interest on our home network on TikTok and other social platforms, with many of you PMing us about the cost of our setup, network diagrams, etc. So, in today's episode, we will be going through the Ubiquiti Site Manager interface and what features you can find with it. When you are first logged in after installation, there are some steps to go through to set up the site, which is your home site in this case. However, I will not be sharing the clips here due to security reasons, but once the site is set up, you will see what's on the screen now. From here, you will see three options, mainly Network, Protect, and Control Panel. Moving down, you will find the ISP Viewer tab, where it will show you an overview of your ISP, average latency, package losses, and uptime percentage. Further down is the Update Manager, where it gives an overview of the current version your devices are operating on and whether they are up to date. After which is the Site Admin tab, which shows the list of admins assigned to manage the site. In this case, I am the super admin who has access to view and edit our system, whereas my wife will only have the view access. There is also the API tab if you are managing and monitoring multiple sites, but I will not go into that as it is not applicable here. We will take a look at the network tab first before moving into the protect and console tabs. In here, you will see a lot of information ranging from your gateway IP, which I have censored out, your system uptime, system and network version, uptime, monthly data usage, live network throughput, top clients using your network, top apps visited, and your access point density. There is also an inbuilt speed test function to check if you are getting the advertised speed provided by your ISP, which you can now see as my network is hitting around 4.5 to 4.7 Gbps since I am on a 5 Gbps plan with my Ubiquiti IDS slash IPS protection turned on. Over here, you will also be able to see the top AP which uses the most data, but uh, for my case, it's only a single access point, so that's the one you are seeing right now. Also, the top devices that has been using the most uh, data bandwidth or data usage, and also the top apps that the clients on your network have been uh, visiting. Also, one of the more useful one would be the overview of the AP uh, Wi-Fi signal or density that you are seeing below to check if uh, your Wi-Fi density or Wi-Fi channels are in the best or optimal channels to provide the best Wi-Fi signals for your house. Here's our network topology for those who were curious. As new BTO comes with a LAN point in each bedroom, which is routed to a patch panel in the DB box area, it allows us to make use of that to keep all of our equipment within the DB box. To keep things neat, I purchased a 24 port patch panel attached with CAT6 couplers and connected each LAN points to a dedicated port. After the cables are connected properly and tidied up, it's time to connect and power up the system. Firstly, we connected the ISP's fiber point to our UDM Pro Max via a SFP Plus RJ45 transceiver, followed by a direct attached cable from the UDM Pro Max to our 16 port PoE switch for a 10 Gbps direct link. We then connected a 10 Gbps 60 watt PoE Plus Plus power injector to the secondary 10 Gbps port on our switch to connect to our U7 Pro XGS access point to allow 10 Gbps uplink Wi Fi coverage around the house. All of our CCTV cameras are connected to the switch via physical connection instead of Wi-Fi and are powered over internet. One of the main reasons for doing so is to reduce latency and interruptions compared to when using Wi-Fi. If any of you are using those Wi-Fi doorbell that operates on Wi-Fi, you should know what I mean as when you access the live view, video will tend to be choppy and laggy. 
Disclaimer that this will also be affected by how many FPS your camera or doorbell supports. We also added a smaller 2.5 Gbps switch in the living and study room for other connections without having to route each devices into the DB box switch. In this topology overview, it also shows you which devices are connected to which device on your network. If you click on the Show Internet Traffic option, you will be able to see the real-time traffic flow pattern and which devices is using a larger amount of traffic, etc. Moving on to the Device tab, you will be able to check on the uplink for each of your device to ensure that it is working as intended. For example, if my access point is supposed to be running at 10 Gbps, but it shows as fast Ethernet FE, I can safely assume that there could be an issue with my LAN cable and I will have to re-terminate the ends properly. Client Device tab will show the full list of devices connected to your network with information on the device vendor, which Wi-Fi VLAN and the Wi-Fi SSID they are connected to, and the Wi-Fi technology of the device. This is extremely useful as it allows me to check and see if there are any unknown devices that are connected to my network or devices that are not supposed to be on a certain network. Port section is pretty self-explanatory as it shows you which ports are in use with the ports being color-coded according to the type of connection speed which is customizable too. The radio tab allows you to view the radio condition around your area, allowing you to optimize your own Wi-Fi by avoiding congested channels which are typically used by neighbors who are connected to the default channels. It does a scan of the area and show a whole list of neighboring devices which I've again censored some information due to sensitivity but you get the idea. Insights tab provides you an overview of all the blocked traffics, where they are coming from, and which are the top affected clients. Settings is where you set up different VLANs. For example, you can create a guest network which will isolate all devices connected to this VLAN from other virtual networks. This prevents your tech-savvy guests from trying to snoop into your network to do funny things. You can also create a dedicated VLAN that have no access to internet for devices such as CCTV cameras if you are worried about some random people accidentally getting into your CCTV and watching your every move. After setting up your VLANs, you can then create different SSID for different devices to connect to. In my case, I've created a dedicated SSID for me and my wife only, a separate SSID for all other IoT devices in our household, and a separate network for guests. You can also assign the type of Wi-Fi band for each SSID easily within this interface. For example, if you only want to allow your IoT devices to connect to 2.5 GHz only, and not roam around to 5 GHz, this would be the best way to do it. You can also create your own traffic and firewall rules to further segregate your network for enhanced security. I'm still in the midst of setting up mine, but you get the idea. Now, the cyber secure is where things get interesting. It provides high-level threat detection, ranging from botnets, virus, malware, spyware, hacking, exploits, P2P and other vulnerabilities detection or without a subscription fee unlike other enterprise level products. You can also do region blocking for incoming, outgoing or bi-directional traffic either via country or territory. It also comes with its own app block which you can apply to specific VLAN to block out irritating apps while browsing the net. Setting custom Wi-Fi speed limits is also something you can do in here. Lastly will be the Alarm Manager feature for our CCTV camera. It allows us to create custom alarms when specific actions are triggered. For example, when someone enters our home and cross a predefined line marked out by us in the Alarm Manager, it will trigger a notification to our phone or email to alert us with the customized message we created in the Alarm Manager. 
Some of you might be wondering why we install a CCTV in our master bedroom. Well, that's for future proving for when we have a baby, as the CCTV will be able to pick up baby crying or if the baby manages to climb out of their baby cot, allowing us to receive notification if we are in the study room or living room for example. You can also set up Joe fencing where if you are in the house, the master bedroom camera will be censored with no audio recording but once you leave the house, recording resumes. All these are just the tip of the iceberg as there are many more interesting and fun features for those techniques out there. Here's a quick tutorial on how to crimp your own LAN cables to a customized LAN without having ugly extra runs hanging all over. You would need to have a RJ45 crimper like this one here which comes with a wire stripper and cutter. Next, you would need to have the RJ45 connector head and an optional boot cover. And not forgetting to get a good quality LAN cable as you will be using them for a few years. To start, you will have to strip the rubber casing protecting the wires inside. This will take some trial and error before you gain the experience to know how much to strip. So do practice a few times and make sure that you are confident before proceeding to terminate your actual cables to minimize cable wastages. After stripping the rubber protection, cut or pull away the piece in the middle and separate the wires according to the 568B color coded standards. A tip is to use the rubber protector which was cut off earlier slide it over the wires and use it to straighten the wires. Trust me, if you are terminating multiple cables, this would save your thumb and fingers from soreness. Once done, Straighten them properly and double check that it matches the color code. If you are using a relief boot, remember to put that in first before putting in the connector. It is important to note that the color code is in the direction where the release mechanism of the connector is facing downwards. Anyway, for me, the perfect length to fit the wires into the connector is around the width of my thumb, but that may differ for each person, so once again, Practice a few rounds to find out the perfect length. Use the straight wire cutter to cut off the excess wires, then proceed to fit the connectors in like this. A good indicator of the perfect length is when the rubber protector fits nicely just within the bottom section of the connector. Anything shorter than this would be a fail aesthetic wise. Finally, ensure that the wires are fully pushed inwards before inserting it into the crimper in the right direction and just press down firmly to properly terminate the cables. A quick test to check if the cables are terminated properly would be to connect the cables to a LAN point and a PC or laptop to run a speed test. If the speed test shows a speed below 100 Mbps, it is probably not terminated correctly and anything above 1 Gbps should be good to go. Here's a quick look at the final setup until we decide to add more devices in the future. There have been some doubt and questions regarding the temperature with the devices in the DB box area. However, it was all taken into consideration during our planning stage, as you can see. There are two nocturnal fans blowing directly onto the device coupled with air vents at the top and bottom of the cabinet doors. You can see that our CCTV and access points that are ceiling mounted do not have any wires hanging out at all which gives it a clean look.
Similarly for our TV console, the smaller switch is hidden within the console itself to maintain the overall minimalist clean look. We hope that this networking series has been helpful to you guys. Do feel free to leave a comment below if you have any questions and we will do our best to answer them. Alright, that's all for this episode. Do like, share and subscribe if you like our content and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye!